is Tiki Fullerton on Your Money. Yes, hello there. Tiki Fullerton every night bringing you a full hour of the very best in business coverage across the nation and internationally, especially where business and politics meet. Coming up, investors grappling with hearing aid giant cochlear results in and full year guidance confirmed, but competition on the increase in top market. CEO Dick Howard sets out his strategy for growth. The Chinese vice president heads to the U.S. for more trade talks, and we talk to City's chief China economist, Li Gang Liu, who is in town on just how the Middle Kingdom is handling trade tensions and where he sees the Chinese economy. And we talk to industry super's peak body industry super Australia's Matt Linden about how his members are affected by the Royal Commission recommendations. Now, well, look, speaking of the Royal Commission, let's start with uh, this big release this afternoon from Top Cop ASIC with the details on just how it will be implementing Kenneth Haynes' recommendations for the regulator. And I think you can sense the toughening up in the language of this release. There are some pretty interesting things in it. Chief Business Reporter Leo Shanahan is going to take us through it. Leo, came out sort of mid this afternoon. Yeah. Yeah, quite interesting. Yeah, I've had a read of it. Look, uh, only saying to the banks probably was uh, who, who were attacked in the Royal Commission was the regulators themselves, and True. namely ASIC. True. Uh, you miss that nuance in this report a bit. You'd kind of think the Royal the Royal Commission, you know, gave them uh, five stars yes, we were on and, the front and, and a few then. helpful yes. recommendations along yeah. the way. You don't get, quite get the tone that ASIC was attacked overall in the Royal Commission. That being said, they did accept uh, there was an overall failing more or less in the way that they had uh, failed to take a lot of um, big corporations to court, namely banks and the so way So this in which, is the enforceable undertaking Yeah, and uh, had been a bit too light on and a mm. big focus of this response is the enforcement and uh, the setting up of this new uh, enforcement division, which interestingly will be kind of Chinese walled from those who deal every day. So this uh, is under the, from, new, the new bloke? Yeah, this is under, the, uh, this is under Daniel Crennan QC, who's mm -hmm. going to head up the enforcement division. And uh, this in internal enforcement review has, set, has recommended that they basically divide, like they do in banks and other financial institutions themselves, mm. uh, the, I suppose, the enforcement and the from uh, those who do everyday work. Yeah, look, we've all already seen uh, they're going to appeal that Westpac uh, decision uh, this week. Just how tough are these, uh, is this regulator going to get? Well, let's have get? a look at the numbers. I mean, they've said in this response the Royal Commission made 11 specific referrals to ASIC uh, for eight entities, and, and this is in addition to another two uh, referred to, so that's 13 in total, and they priority work on those matters. ASIC are undertaking another 12 investigations into case studies that were before the Royal Commission, another two case studies which they'd already commenced proceedings on, Nullis and Terry McMaster. Yes, of course, the NAB. unfortunate yeah. Yes, and NAB, so uh, the this uh, unfortunate fellow who fainted in the stand and ASIC are assessing another 16 case studies to see whether investigations uh, should be commenced. Mm -hmm. So look, uh, they're pretty heavy on the, on the referrals and, and, and there's a lot of pressure on them, obviously, mm -hmm. to get on with that. So I understand Mr Crennan is going to meet with the Treasurer tomorrow mm -hmm. talking about ASIC's response. Uh, Commonwealth DPP met in the, was questioned in the Senate inquiry, uh, the Senate estimates uh, this afternoon yes. on their response. They've said they've spoken to ASIC about the response. They're yet to receive these recommendations. But on that point, uh, ASIC also say, aside from the Royal Commission case studies, ASIC enforcement teams are undertaking a large volume of work on a range of misconduct relating to major financial institutions and their representatives. ASIC expects these investigations to result in a number of referrals to the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions for assessment of criminal prosecution. So well, that so could either on, include... A large number and a, yeah. number, a large number of referrals yes, to so, the CDPP. Yes, so uh, that is included in that initial no number I gave you. There could be extra ones, but basically uh, they're waving a red flag here saying, look, uh, we're doing a lot. And uh, also boasting that they've uh, they've 50% spike in the number of active investigations into large financial but, institutions you know, when, from a year ago. When the Hain report came out, um, obviously we had Ken Henry and Andrew Thorburn uh, falling on their swords. But there was this criticism that it was a bit sort of light on, a bit wimpy. Um, but by going hard on the regulator who is now responding yeah. by going hard, 
it looks like Hain is actually driving uh, very hard in terms of accountability, potentially. I, I think it's understated the amount of extra powers that ASIC have received uh, from the Royal Commission, and these relate anywhere to bear enforcement, to in, including in superannuation. They're probably taking a driving, much more of a driving force away from ASIC. And also, as we said, in this enforcement uh, in this uh, enforcement imprimatur they've been given mm. to push on those. And, yeah, I think ultimately, look, despite getting a whack around, uh, James Shipton might sit back and go, you know what, out of Hain Royal Commission, we didn't do that badly because we're going to get more funding and more powers, and that's what they're always complaining about. Leo Shanahan, thank you very much. Right, well, let's go to corporate now. Market Darling Cochlear reported today with the market not altogether comfortable on the growth story. It was a 16% rise in half-year profit as more patients with hearing loss replace old implants with new processors. Net profit for the period came in around $130 million with an interim dividend of $1.55 a share declared. Implant unit sales were up a subdued 5% in the period with increased competition, especially in Cochlear's top market of the U.S. Cochlear also gave an update on its global expansion, building a new factory in central China, which is set to open next year. The company reaffirmed previous guidance for net profit of between $265, $275 million for the full year through to June, which uh, at the top of the range, at uh, the end, uh, as of the top of the range, sorry, would be a rise of 12% on a year ago. Well, Cochlear shares did take a bit of a battering during trade today. They closed down 7.5%. I went through the results with CEO Dig Howard a little earlier. Dick Howard, thank you very much for joining me. Now, uh, your half-year results through. Shares are off quite uh, a lot, 8%. Now, you've confirmed guidance. I guess uh, uh, analysts still grappling with, with what your outlook, particularly as far as the U.S. market and growth is concerned there. Yeah, look, I think so. I think um, we've come off three years of very strong growth across developed countries for our cochlear implant sales and that growth has come from a mix of market growth and market share gains on the back of new product launches and when we look back at the cochlear implant industry over time we do see that market share moves with uh, product launches and that's what we've seen in the last half with a, a competitor launch uh, we've lost some share uh, particularly in the US and in Germany and that's led to lower growth uh, for so is that is that Sonova is that Sonova because everyone's mentioning competition and no the, one's the, saying any name just to be clear or is it metal or is it uh, Bose with a new product I mean there seem to be a lot of uh, players in the space yes yeah, so, so now um, both uh, our main competitors uh, have uh, MRI three Tesla MRI compatibility yeah uh, in my, in the key markets and it was Sonova that uh, launched in the last half. Right, okay. Because I guess looking at the business overall, the comment has been, you know, for years, Cochlear's been such a market darling uh, and it's been uh, priced to, to perfection uh, ex with the expectation of this 10% profit growth. Now you've, you've got that in this half. I think it was 11 if you take account of the, the, the even accounting for the Trump tax cuts. Um, can it, though, continue? Because you say you're focusing on uh, the, the, the older age group, but it is indeed a market where everybody else is now and with some new and perhaps interesting products. Yeah, look, we definitely think that growth can conti continue. There is enormous potential, uh, particularly in the adults and, and the, the seniors segment particularly. Um, at the moment, there are hundreds of thousands of people each year with severe to profound hearing loss that get hearing aids when there is increasing amount of evidence that those people would get better hearing outcomes if they got a cochlear implant. So we that's and that's what our strategies are focused on is driving awareness and access and building a referral path from hearing aids to cochlear implants for those people with severe to profound hearing loss. So there's enormous potential for future growth. Um, it's hard and it takes a lot of investment for us to get that growth and that's that's what we're doing now. So we certainly believe that we can continue to grow uh, in developed markets over time. So in dealing with this immediate issue where there seems to be a bit of a buzz around MRI compatibility, are you, go are you looking to come back with a, with a product that will 
deal with that? Because as you say, you're so committed to research, 12% spending in research. Um, can you come back quickly? And how likely do you think that's going to be an ongoing dent for you until you have a new product? Yes, as, as I said, over time we do see market share move on product launches and our competitors are, are strong and what they will do is look for features that we don't have and uh, target that in their development and that makes perfect sense. We do, as you say, spend a lot of money on R&D and we have a good product pipeline over the next 18 months and we also have significant investments uh, on our core technology that will take us out over the next five to ten years. Yeah. Now we don't um, ever talk about the timing of product launches or specific features in product, product launches. Yeah, but you don't see an MRI thing as, as a game changer. It's just one more, uh, you know, bell or whistle, if you like, uh, which, which is attracting people now, but you'll have another product out there which will pull it back. Is that where we're going? Yes, I see that, that it is, as you say, it's an extra feature. It's a feature that is attractive to a segment of the market. Um, there are many features that are attractive to our customers and our Indeed. potential customers. Uh, we've been very focused on hearing performance and on managing the, the cost of care so that more people can get access uh, over time. Uh, and, and we have a long list of potential projects that we can undertake and we always look carefully at the decisions we make in terms of R&D and uh, the product features that we bring in over time. Yeah, and uh, I guess... We're certainly confident of our long run ability to be competitive. Yeah, exactly. And I guess from Cochlear's point of view, it's the high quality and then the service going forward uh, that, uh, that, that uh, is central to your brand. Yes, yeah, so we, we get certainly well known in the market for the service we provide both to our customers and to the professional partners who work with our customers. Um, and the reliability of our products uh, is, is very, very high. Um, you know, that takes years to build the ability to build and manufacture a reliable implant and reliable sound processes uh, so that they are easy to use uh, over a lifetime for our customers. So, so we have some, uh, through our heritage and through our long investment, some great strengths in our technology and we'll continue to reinforce those and we'll continue to invest uh, to build on those to retain a competitive edge. Yeah, um, the, the, the young market is quite saturated, as you uh, said. Uh, it makes it obviously perfect sense to go for the older market. One of the other things that hit, presumably is hitting everybody in the market, in, in Europe anyway, is, uh, is health budgets. Yeah, so, so health budge, budgets in um, Western Europe particularly have... Uh, uh, been constrained either through caps on funding or limits on the indication, i.e. limits on who is allowed to get a cochlear implant. Uh, that's been the case for many years and we've been working at this for many years and mm. we have successes uh, over time, so the amount of money allocated to cochlear implants has been growing. Uh, we saw in Japan uh, 18 months ago an expansion of indications which has led to faster growth in cochlear implant sales in Japan more recently and in the UK right now health authorities there are looking at the indications in the UK and we're optimistic that they will expand the indications which will give more people uh, with hearing loss access to cochlear implants over the next few months. Yeah. But these are long term projects um, and there is great competition for healthcare budgets right around the world. Well indeed and as you were saying on the call, um, you know the, the, the budget is for services and for the products themselves very often. Yeah, that, that's right. So uh, what we see that is in many cases is that budgets are allocated to hospitals for their cochlear implant program and that implant program includes both the new implants and upgrades to existing customers. So if the upgrades uh, go up or, or grow significantly, then that takes from the overall budget and leaves less for cochlear implants. And I think we've seen some of that happen in a few places in the first half. Now, Dick, you are building up inventory ahead of Brexit, is that right? Yeah, that, that, small amounts. Our inventory moves, moves up and down over time. Uh, there's a small in increment due to um, Brexit. Uh, we've been, as many companies that operate in Europe and the UK, have been preparing for Brexit uh, actually since the, uh, the referendum. Um, we will see what happens over the next six weeks or so. Indeed. Uh, but uh, we think we're well prepared for... Um, any of the potential range of outcomes.
Good -o. And uh, what about uh, the election back here? Because, of course, you uh, had a, a bit of a push to get the government to focus on R&D, but that seems to have uh, fallen on deaf ears, if you don't mind me saying. Yes. Yeah, look, we're, we're very disappointed that there is no resolution on the support for R&D in Australia. I think R&D expenditure by business and by government is critical to the future competitiveness of Australia. Uh, and, com and countries compete aggressively for companies like us that do genuine R&D. Mm. And in Australia, we've had uncertainty now for the last few years on what will be funded and how much it will be funded. That's just no good for Australia's competitiveness over the, over the long run. So it's no good for Cochlear, but much more importantly, it's no good for Australia not to have clarity. Uh, and it's, I think, surprising that there isn't bipartisan agreement that appropriate funding of R&D by government is an important part of investing into the future of the country and in future jobs in Australia. Mm. Well, you're not alone there. I, I totally agree with you. Um, now, and, and so going forward, Dig, obviously the, the, um, the, the building this channel from hearing aids uh, going through to, to cochlear implant plants, building that path, uh, you're saying is, is very key to your growth strategy. Yes, it is. It is. So uh, at the moment, uh, I think most people know what a hearing aid is and understand when a hearing aid uh, can be used, but very few people understand uh, where, what a cochlear implant is and where a cochlear implant can be used. And what's happened is over time, cochlear implants have really improved in terms of their capability to improve people's hearing. So if you go back 10 or 20 years, cochlear implants were really for people with profound hearing loss. Mm. Now they perform so well that it's people with severe to profound hearing loss who get great benefit from cochlear implants. And so we've got a work to do to educate uh, not only potential customers but also uh, people who work in hearing aids of how much cochlear implant technology has advanced over the last 10 years uh, so that they can help provide the best care for their customers. Uh, so they do get access to cochlear implants. Now we've been working at this uh, in the US over the last few years and we are seeing an increase in referrals from hearing aid channel through to cochlear implant surgeries. Right. Now it's still small numbers but those numbers are growing and that gives us confidence that we are on the right track with, uh, with our investments. Well Dick Howard, thank you so much for taking us through your results. Uh, you're on guidance for the full year as I say. I look forward to talking to you then. Thank you very much. Thanks Tiki, great to talk to you again. After the break, we'll get our dose of business gossip with the Australian's Margin Call editor, Will Glasgow, next. You're watching Tiki on Your Money. Now, back to Tiki. Welcome back. Let's move to business gossip now. And the Australian is seeing John Wiley as a likely suitor for Grain Corp. The latest reports concern a capital raising for Mr Wiley's Tanara Capital for a new investment fund, quite a big one, which the Australian says is linked to his keen interest in the $2 billion Grain Corp. Well, Australian's margin call editor, Will Glasgow, of course, has been following this battle for the big grain handler. Uh, now, um, Will, you call him Wiley Wiley. Why is he wily wily? <laughs> well, look, we revealed on the weekend that, I mean, there was some eyebrows raised about why John Wiley was taking such a high profile um, position in the takeover battle for Grain Corp, when he yeah. has a very marginal um, holding in the company. I mean, yeah. it's a couple of million dollars, I think, through his Tanara fund. But yeah. as we revealed in the weekend, Australian, he's raising money. $800 million worth of money. That's a lot of money. A lot of money yeah. for a fund. Now, it's not the, the Grain Corp. The Grain Corp um, investment is the kind of style that this fund would do. It's not actually coming from that fund. So describe the style. It's it's not activist. Well, it's sort of friendly <laughs> yeah. activist. It's your white knight. Yeah. Is it? Well, John Wiley's very keen to impress that on people as yes. he's pitching it. That it's not activist. Not like those sort of noisy, brash U.S. billionaire activists. The TPG right? t uh, yeah, type yeah. people. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So it, what he's saying is it's a very cooperative thing. They want to work with management. They want to be long term. 
um, shareholders, they want to help other shareholders on the registry, saying mm. they're going to bring private equity style thinking yes. to a public listed environment. Okay, so meanwhile in all of this, we do actually have the Grain Corp AGM the tomorrow. tomorrow yes. So Graham Bla Bradley's uh, got a lot of thinking to do as yeah. chair. Um, there are uh, two big shareholders and the race could be on for what they might do in terms of REM reports, that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah. So two big shareholders there, Elliston, Ashup Jacobs investment firm, yes, and Perpetual, led by Paul Scamavaris. And, um, Scammer. Mm. Yeah, look, one of them, well, there's, there's been some unhappiness with Graham Bradley from some of the shareholders about uh, his, what they thought was his sort of tardiness in dealing with this offer from the long-term asset partners group, that group with Tony Shepard and Chris Craddock and that crew. Chris Crash Ca Craddock, Chris the Crash names Craddock. keep coming. <laughs> it's okay. quite a cast, so, yeah. So actually taking this back a bit, yeah. there was this tilt There's at a tilt. Grain, Grain Corp. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and uh, so it was, it was that uh, he took too long. Too long to, to reveal that it had happened, right? So that it was more than two weeks after an offer had come in that they, were, they had this pitch, this uh, $2.4 billion pitch, which yes. they, they showed, you know, they had Goldman Sachs on board to had secured the finance and they had an a, arrangement with an international ins insurer yes. to go ahead with this $2.4 billion bid, but Graham Bradley didn't disclose that to the market for more than two weeks, so the shareholders actually found out about it through their discussions with Tony Shepard's crew, not from the company, so, and were quite annoyed. So tomorrow yes. we're going to see an expression of some displeasure at that. Um, Perpetual, yes. I understand, are going to vote, have voted against uh, Don McGecky, who's the Grain Corp director up for re-election. Oh, that's that. it. Well, he's, so, yes, he's been there for ages. Yeah, so uh, he chairs AACO, I think. AACO, yeah, yeah, the former Telstra chair. Yeah. So there's yep. going to be quite a big, now we don't know if Elliston will as well, but there's yeah, going to be quite a big vote against uh, his election mm -hmm. and then all, and uh, also the, rem rep or the remuneration for the CEO there. Right. So, um, but wow. it's not that they're trying to spill the board, they're just trying to put pressure on Bradley, who yes. they want to be in negotiating and seriously with uh, Tony Shepard's crew on this. Thing. Yeah, and meanwhile, John Wiley on the sidelines. Okay, now before you go, uh, you uh, you reckon Christine Holgate dodged a bullet? Oh, she sure did. <laughs> <laughs> well, the company that she was running, the pill, uh, pill company Blackmores, which, mm. you know, while she oh, was the CEO of, today, yeah, yeah, I mean, more down 25% today, more than half a billion dollar of its market cap gone. Mm. Um, she was lucky enough to get out of that a couple of years ago before yeah. the market really turned in China on this company. She had a real, really charmed she ride there, you know. I mean, you know, maybe it was great management, maybe yeah. it was great luck, maybe it was both. But yes. anyway, today was not her problem. Well, now she's running Aussie Post. She's running Aussie Post. And in a second stroke of good news, yes. she has made history today by not being invited by the Senate Estimates Committee to appear before it, which no one in, in Post can remember that ever happening. It certainly never happened. Why in, is that? Well, it's because they couldn't fit, because they've got a compressed uh, schedule, because we've got the election coming up. Oh. The committee wanted enough time to grill um, acting managing director of the ABC, David Anderson. Oh, with all those And dramas. this committee also looks into the NBN, so Stephen Rue, they wanted him to have plenty of time to talk to him about uh, his estimates on its commercial future and everything. Oh, right. Um, well, so lucky old Christine. Lucky okay. rate for Christine, twice today. OK, well, Glasgow, very interesting. And we'll keep across that grain call because it's an unfinished business. Mm. Thanks, Will. Right, China's second in command will visit the United States this week as part of efforts to resolve the ongoing trade war. Vice Premier Liu He will meet with U.S. Tre Treasury Secretary and U.S. Trade Representatives in Washington on Thursday, according to China's Commerce Ministry. It follows the U.S. delegation's recent trip to China and amid strained trade tensions, which we talk about all the time. U.S. President Donald Trump implemented billions of dollars worth of trade tariffs on China last year in an effort to fix a trade deficit. Well, March 1 is the supposed lead deadline for another hike. More on that and look forward to China's economic outlook for 2019. I spoke with Li Gang Liu, city's chief China economist, a little earlier. Li Gang Liu, very nice to talk to you. Uh, let's start with trade. And I see that uh, the Chinese vice president is, or, is to visit the United States for more talks this week. Is that reason for optimism? I would think so. Uh, as uh, the last uh, three rounds talks suggest that, uh, you know, uh, both countries are, are close to a deal. And, 
but uh, there are some remaining sticking issues. I think the biggest challenge facing two economies is uh, what kind of mechanism to verify China's progress. Uh, I would think that China would like to refer to WTO for this verification, but the uh, U.S. does not uh, want such an approach. It would like to do it uh, bilaterally. Uh, given this is related to sovereignty, perhaps there's more give and take uh, need to be hatched out. Uh, so let's see. Uh, we heard that uh, most of the U.S. demands has more or less been met. Uh, so that, uh, you know, it's up to President Trump to decide whether he would like to have some kind of minimum deal yes. so that both countries can move on. But, Li Gang, this, I mean, at its heart, this all started with America's concerns about uh, tech know-how, its tech knowledge uh, being somehow uh, t taken by the Chinese. Now, is this deal, if it comes through, going to find a solution to that original problem? I think so. Uh, in terms of, of IP protection, China has made a huge efforts uh, uh, right after President Xi's returning from the G20 summit. Uh, we saw 38 ministries uh, issue the new guidelines uh, to make IP violation more punishable. Uh, at the same time, China's Supu Supreme Court uh, set up an IP court so that uh, foreign companies, if they have an issue, they can use this court directly. Yes. And in terms of false technology transfer, uh, in auto sector, we have been seeing that uh, a Tesla's entry into China does not require any uh, partnership. Uh, this means that uh, without a false joint venture requirement, uh, uh, multinational companies are not required to transfer technology. Right. Obviously, there are other issues in cyber uh, evasion, theft uh, related to technology, and that's a behavior issue. Perhaps both countries could monitor that further. Okay, but you think that it's possible at least that the uh, meetings this week could deliver some solution uh, because we've got that March 1 deadline or for, for the possible uh, hikes in tariff by the US president, or do you think a more likely scenario is indeed another delay, a postponement? I think probably a, de a more likely de scenario is uh, uh, another postpone mm. of the imposition of 15% more tariff. Or, uh, perhaps uh, another likely scenario is that the uh, U.S. could uh, offer not to uh, hike the tariff after March uh, uh, 1st indefinitely. Uh, so okay. both scenarios uh, will be very good for the global economy and the uh, Chinese economy in particular. We right. estimate that the current uh, uh, tariff impact on the Chinese economy uh, will be limited uh, a maximum 0.54 percentage points. And if you were to spread this uh, into two to three year terms, uh, per year impact on GDP growth uh, on China's economy will be maximum 0.3 percentage points, okay. are highly manageable. Because, uh, so uh, if we were to yeah. see such a kind of outcome, it is a really good uh, scenario for the global economy. Indeed, and as you say, for China, because I think your numbers are that China's export growth is, is expected to almost half to 5.1 percent uh, year on year in 2019. Now, uh, what, what are your numbers for overall GDP? growth and, and what would, what's driving that? Yeah, we think China's growth could continue to slow down to 6.2 percent, affecting in the potential 15 percent tariff e increase after March 1st. Uh, as I mentioned, that uh, if after March 1st uh, this 15 percent uh, tariff is no longer there, and yes. we may see upside risk on the Chinese economy. Overall, we have seen rather uh, effective policy implementation so far. 
last week's credit data uh, was uh, uh, astonishing. Uh, you know, TSF data was 4.6 trillion, mm. way above market expectation. Uh, it means that uh, perhaps uh, the Chinese policy responses uh, since Ju July last year has started to work through the uh, economy. Uh, okay. So if and uh, the f external risk was minimized, uh, we may see upside risk on, on the Chinese economy. And Liang, is that uh, growth number you got there, is that going to be high enough for China to achieve its employment targets? Because that's very important, isn't it? Indeed, uh, and our estimate uh, suggests that uh, China will need a minimum 6.1% uh, GDP growth in order to create 30 million jobs. Uh, uh, you know, 30 million is the number we saw over the last five years. Uh, uh, given Chinese uh, college graduates are about uh, seven to eight million per year, uh, it is very important uh, for this group of people to have. Uh, uh, jobs. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, we think that uh, in order to provide some cushion, uh, uh, the NPC in early March will continue to announce uh, a growth target at, at around 6.5%. Okay, and what about the, you know, some of the sectors? What about uh, property investment? What about uh, retail? Yeah, we think that uh, property investment this year will remain robust. Uh, one leading indicator is that. Uh, Last year's uh, land sales uh, by provincial government uh, suggests that uh, it was 6.5 trillion RMB, 1.5 trillion uh, higher than 2017 number. Uh, latest regulations require Chinese property developers to develop that uh, auction land quickly within one year. So this means that. Uh, uh, this year's uh, uh, property investment uh, should remain robust. So our forecast is uh, six percent year on year. And uh, in terms of consumption, we need to look at uh, China's uh, personal income tax cut. Uh, uh, we think this is a fairly sizable personal income tax cut. Uh, out of 1.2 trillion personal income tax revenue, the government uh, more or less uh, gave up 400 to 500 billion. Uh, so uh, this uh, tax uh, cut will first uh, support uh, consumer, consumer staples. Uh, should we see more policies to boost uh, consumer durables? And we tend to think that uh, this year China's car sales and uh, home, supply, home appliance uh, could start to uh, pick up. And so uh, you can see uh, uh, the government uh, has been rather proactive so far, but yes. uh, the tr external shock uh, still uh, presents a lot of uh, uncertainty yep. to Chinese uh, economic outlook. Okay, so briefly, in terms of, chi of, of Australia's opportunity with China, you do see um, a, you know, a c continuing reasonably bright future. Yes, I think, uh, uh, you know, Chinese economy is highly linked with the Australian economy, and uh, it's very likely the transition of the Chinese economy from investment to consumption will also benefit uh, the Australian economy. Uh, in addition, uh, we think that uh, in the next stage, perhaps uh, uh, Chinese investment strategy in Australia may shift, uh, moving from taking a lead role in project uh, uh, to as to be as a, a secondary type of uh, uh, you know uh, shareholder, mm. and so at the same time, uh, China could secure long-term supply in agriculture goods uh, and uh, also energy goods uh, to China. So if mm. China were to play this role, I think uh, you know perhaps Chinese investment could be more accessible in Australia and uh, both countries can continue to grow. Indeed, we do see China's consumer potential is huge. By 2025, China could be the second largest consumer market uh, in the world. Uh, with the emerging uh, middle class people, mm -hmm. they are more sensitive to what they eat, uh, where they spend the vacation, where they send their kids for education. Australia will continue to be a very 
natural yes. partner for China's next stage of economic development. All right. Well, it's such an important relationship. Li Gang Liu, thank you so much for joining us there from City. Thank you. After the break, how will the government's super legislation changes impact industry funds? Deputy Industry Super Australia CEO Matthew Linden will join us next. This is Tiki on Your Money, covering the big business stories. Welcome back. Well, as we all know, there are 76 recommendations made by Kenneth Hayne in his final report to the Royal Commission. And the government wasted no time pushing through two of them, which impact uh, super and industry super in particular. Funny that. The protecting your superannuation package passed the Senate on Thursday. That means that the trustee boards are now to put members first uh, or be on the end of civil penalties if they don't. And there's to be an end to duchessing of clients to keep their funds, the so-called host plus measure. Well, what does the sector make of these proposals? I'm joined now by Industry Super Australia's Deputy Chief Executive, Matt Linden. Matt, thanks very much for joining us uh, there. Tell me first, what is Industry Super Australia, just so that we're all clear about this? Oh, so Industry Super Australia undertakes um, policy, research and advocacy and also undertakes a joint marketing campaign on behalf of 16 Industry Super Funds. Uh, which have around 6 million members or half the workforce. OK, so as I said, perhaps no surprise the government pushed these two reforms through first. Sorry, Tiki? I could, um, but I'm saying could perhaps you, I'm sorry, bit, could you ask that? A, a bit cheeky perhaps, but perhaps no surprise that the government put these two bills through first, uh, which, uh, which really do go to industry super as much as anyone. Uh, well, look, the, these bills are... Uh, quite broad uh, in respect to their impact. They've been uh, on the books in the Senate for, uh, in, in one case, over a year and for another six months. So they're not mm. a surprise at all. Uh, the industry has been working through very carefully uh, what the potential impacts are. And, um, I mean, overall, I'd make the assessment that we think that it's uh, uh, quite important legislation for members. Yeah, I mean, you, you could say, as a punter, why on earth do trustees of super funds have to be goaded to put members first? It seems a rather extraordinary thing. That should be their prime duty, shouldn't it? Well, it certainly should. That's very clear um, in the superannuation law, the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act. Mm. Um, and certainly for industry super funds, that's the approach which they take uh, to the task when they sit around the boardroom table. Um, yep. They are very much have members front and centre, but that's not the case for all super funds. Yeah. Will it make a big change, this uh, um, banning of any sort of uh, duchessing, particularly to sporting events, to try and uh, keep the relationship and keep members' funds there? Will it make a big difference, do you think, to the industry? It's sort of the equivalent of the end of the broker long lunch, isn't it? Yeah, well, look, this was um, one aspect which came out of the Royal Commission. Um, our assessment is we certainly supported these changes. Our view mm. is that it's not uh, a measure that's particularly targeted at industry funds. They no. enhanced existing provisions uh, which were meant to uh, prevent incentives or inducements to employers to select a default superannuation fund at a workplace. Uh, and it will have, in our view, uh, an equal impact on many of the funds run by the banks uh, when it comes to cross-selling uh, some of their other business banking products, so okay. uh, special okay. deals on insurance or discounts on overdraft, that sort of thing. So more broadly, obviously if Labor gets in in May, uh, all of the recommendations are going to be uh, carried through. Are there any concerns that you specifically have with any of them? Uh, well, when, uh, when we had a look at the final report of the Royal Commission, we were broadly satisfied that they were uh, recommendations which uh, uh, taken together uh, will we'll set the industry up on a firmer footing. Um, uh, in principle, our view was that all of those recommendations certainly made a good deal of sense uh, mm. and will lead to better outcomes for members. So, uh, for example, the idea of, of uh, capping of uh, fees at 3% for, for low account balances and, and uh, also that the, the consolidation of some of these lower accounts, you're, you're going to welcome that. 
Yeah, well, that was in one of the bills which uh, has passed uh, the yes. parliament just yesterday. Yes. Um, it's, uh, those measures are unambiguously positive for members. Uh, it's been a major bugbear for most uh, Australians when it comes to superannuation. It's quite difficult to uh, consolidate multiple accounts. Uh, and this, for the first time, will empower uh, the ATO or make sure that we have laws which mean that it can happen automatically and in a mm. compulsory system uh, we think that's entirely appropriate and should take the legwork out of it for most members uh, and lead to better outcomes. Same thing with fee caps. Um, it was certainly the case for those with smaller balances. Uh, the laws as they stood meant that funds had to charge equivalent fees irrespective of account balance. Um, so these changes to the law mean uh, that there'll be fee caps in place uh, and it will mean particularly for younger people uh, getting their first start in the workforce that um, their superannuation can start building rather than being eroded. Uh, I guess fees. one of the outstanding issues is the idea that uh, you know young Australians shouldn't be automatically charged life insurance within super. Now there have been issues around that for, I know there have been concerns raised about certain sectors. Cannot that go through even if it needs some carve-outs? Uh, well, in the bill that went through the Parliament yesterday, um, there are some measures which mean that superannuation trustees can no longer offer default insurance mm. uh, to members who have inactive accounts. Um, that's irrespective of age and yep. irrespective of balance. Uh, but it is true that um, in the Senate the, the government did do a deal with the Greens where they took out specific protections for those aged under 25 and those with balances under $6,000. Mm. Um, we didn't think that that was necessary. Uh, we thought that there needed to be some additional protections, particularly for those working in higher risk industries. Uh, but nevertheless, the outcome of the Senate was this deal which pulled those two uh, elements out. Yeah. So, more broadly, you're pretty happy there in industry super. Uh, you've uh, got more funds under management than uh, the retail, uh, the retail side of things does now. You took over last year. Um, both sides of Parliament have walked back from uh, getting more independent board representation. That didn't come up through Hain. And in, in fact, it's quite extraordinary, I think, that Hain made recommendations on super, given that he really didn't inquire into the sector at all. Um, well, look, he, there was obviously a key round which looked at superannuation and we were uh, happy to see that he thought it was not the right approach to try and mandate board structures. Um, yeah, but, this I, but is I mean, he didn't do very much. Policy, which has been when, when, I was going, sorry to interrupt, but he didn't do very much given that, I mean, really he wound in the Productivity Commission recommendations rather than doing a lot of his own research there. Wouldn't that be fair to say? Oh, look, that would be fair to say. Our understanding was that the Productivity Commission did certainly uh, uh, have some influence in respect mm. to a lot of the work which was going on behind the scenes. Um, and we need to consider in terms of the impacts on members and, and the industry, we probably need to consider the cumulative impact of not just the Royal Commission final report, but also mm. obviously the Productivity Commission review and how uh, the, uh, the government of the day, um, uh, most likely after the election, will go about implementing those changes. Yeah, look, that'll be very interesting, the whole best in show and all that sort of stuff. Well, we'll see what happens and who gets in. I'm sure it'll drive that. Matt Linden, thanks so much for joining us. Certainly. Thanks, Dickie. OK, we're well, moving to international news now. And seven MPs have staged a dramatic walkout from Britain's opposition Labour Party over Jeremy Corbyn's handling of Brexit. The group declared they will now form an independent group, reducing the party's seats in the House of Commons. They have also cited a wave of anti-Semitism within the party's ranks, saying the issues were never addressed. The intervention threatens to reignite old rows over Brexit. The Labour leader says he's disappointed by their decision. Well, after the break, we'll get across some of today's market moves with InvestSmart's Evan Lucas next. Now, back to Tiki. Welcome back to another big day of reporting and a bit of a shock, I guess, at Blackmore's with CEO Richard Henry battling to manage the volatile China market by spreading his sales beyond China. Coles also had its first report as a public company. There's a bit of a reality check there too. Well, let's take a deep dive now into today's ASX 200 company results. Joining me for his take 
Evan Lucas from InvestSmart. Evan, good day there. Um, now, uh, first, well, can I can I ask you about Coles first? Because of course, this was its first uh, results as a public company once more. Yeah, it was. And, and look, you probably got to take them out as, as what they are. They're, they're probably disappointing, and the, more, the market told you that down four percent in terms of where they finished. But it, it's more than that. There is pros and cons to it. I think the market was impressed that they've actually got their debt level down much faster than expected. So it's about 1.16 billion. The market had around 1.6. That was what I took as a positive. Yes. But overall, things just generally are just soft. And I think that's the only way to look at it. Like for like sales, below expectations, net margins, again, slightly weaker than expectations. The liquor business is clearly a headwind. They're trying to point it down to the fact that seasonal issues have been a problem. That's not really the best way to look at it. Vintage mm. sellers continue to be a real thorn and a real drag. Uh, you get something like Liquorland, which is doing okay, but liquor is a slight problem for them. Coles Express was okay, but then let's have a look at the Coles business and where it currently sits. It did see ever so slight increase in, in food inflation, 0.15 or 1%. Now, that is better than the last time, this time last year, but it is really lax and it's really flat. Their overall square meterage sales was flat and it missed market expectations by about 3% on the top line, middle and bottom. So revenue, so, EBITDA and net so, profit. So also this would have nothing to do with a new chap at the top drawing a line on first results, all that sort of thing? Maybe, but again, I mean, most of what we've known from Coles for a long, long time from West Farmers has been part of the reason why they flicked it out. Let's, let's also probably put that out there, is that it's a very capital-intensive business yes. that was growing at a level for West Farmers being a capital allocator. That's the way to obviously talk about West Farmers, but just no longer was, was in their, their sort of their interest, and that's why they've moved it out. It's not a Bunnings. It's, even, it's not even an office works, if you want to put a look at that way. And that's yes. why you look at now it being out there and back out in the public sphere as an independent company, as you alluded to, is that it's just a slow and steady plodding business. And that's what you've been told today. So okay. it is a, a disappointing number overall. It's certainly by no means the worst, and it's certainly by no means saying that it's, you know, it can't pick its game up, but the market's probably fair in saying that it's worth 12 bucks rather than what the forecasted expectations from most analysts is, which yes. is $13.50. Okay. Briefly, Blackmores, um, do we think this is a, you know, a, a, a just sort of a resetting in terms of relationship with China? Partly. I, I think this is also a resetting of the, the share price, again, being a market mm. darling, overbid, and then you get back to the sort of stuff that we always look at, which is, you know, PE fundamentals having a, you know, 30 times earnings. If you're going to have mm. a miss like they did today and tell you a disappointing expectations from China, you are going to be savaged. And that's what we've okay. seen for a long time. Blackmore's, it's a great company, but it's got to probably get back to a multiple that's more conducive for what it actually does. OK. All right. Now, listen, we must rush on to hmm. the minutes, the RBA minutes, because um, very interesting minutes they must have been. They were very neutral as expected. I, look, mm -hmm. I think the minutes were what we sort of were a reflection of the statement. What gets me out of the minutes and what I hope happens on Friday, because this is the more important part of this, is Philip Lowe is testifying to the parliamentary committee. The parliamentary committee, if they're worth anything of their pinch of salt, they should be asking him questions as what has changed in the last nine weeks around employment that now has employment as a mandate to probably trigger a possible rate cut or cuts sometime in the future. That is the mm -hmm. way you look at the statement. And what he's been saying publicly since is that employment we're watching, if it moved up, we would probably actually watch the act. So what in the data has caused an inflection point from the board? And that, I think, is the most key thing. Tomorrow we've got the wage price index. Uh, when Thursday we've got the employment data. And then we've got him speaking on Friday. It's a plethora of that information. And I, as I said, the best way to answer that question is a question to come on Friday. The, they must ask, the panel must ask, is there something in the employment market that has changed that is now making you concerned that it's going to have to cut rates at the RBA? Do you think that's a market sensitive question? Yes, I do. Now, that's the next thing. So it's an Aussie dollar sensitive question. If he was to say that we actually believe it's slowing, then that's the case. But the caveat to this, both in the minutes and in the statement of monetary policy, they believe the unemployment rate will be 4.75% at the end of the year. That's a strengthening market. That's a strengthening employment market. So that's why there is a confliction to this and why when you initially saw the statement and what, you've been, what they've been saying over the last couple of days, the Aussie has fallen. 
But when you read into what they're suggesting and what their growth profile is suggesting, it's actually a positive. And that's the mixed messages that everybody's sort of asking mm. the question, where do they actually sit uh, in terms of that whole overall view? Evan Lucas, great to talk as always. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Dickie. Well, that's all for the show tonight. Tomorrow night, we speak with A2 CEO Jane Herdlicker from across the ditch on her company's results. Thanks for your company.